Why do we need innovation? First of all, do we need innovation? Now, I know that sounded like a deep question, but the answer is yes. Definitely yes. And here are a couple of reasons why. Reason number one, the world isn't perfect and we still need to work on it a little to make it a better place. And I know I said perfect, but there, this really isn't about perfection. It's just that it's undeniable that the world can be unfair, unsafe, unsustainable, and sometimes just plain unreasonable. Reason number two for why we need innovation is that we just can't help it. Um, if we know, or even if we think, that there is a better way for us to do things, then there is no stopping us in trying to get there. No matter what we do, we keep finding ways to make things work better, work faster, um, make things more profitable, require less effort. No matter what we do, we are driven by progress and by the idea of moving forward. Now the question is, which way is forward? And I don't have a definite answer for that one. I'm sorry. <laughs> but here is my journey with innovation. And funnily enough, it didn't really start as something intentional. I didn't wake up one morning and say, hey, I want to have an idea. That's not really how it happened, at least for me. What happened was I was 20 years old and I was in engineering school. And that's when I heard about ALS for the first time. ALS is short for amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. It's also called Lou Gehrig's disease. It's a progressive paralysis that affects all the muscles in the body, but doesn't affect the patient's cognitive abilities. So it's essentially, the patients are able to hear and understand everything you tell them. They just can't respond because they just can't articulate. And that just um, floored me. I, I pride myself on being someone who has a million ideas, a million emotions. I, I'm an extrovert. I like to talk. Shocking. Um, and the idea that around the world there are people who might have as many emotions as me and as many ideas as me but are unable to voice them due to their physical limitations, it just it shook me to my very core. And that's when I heard that the patients, no matter how paralyzed they are, they can systematically control just a little bit of movement around or within their eyes. And so I thought, wait, if they can move their eyes, then there is a way for us to understand them and hear what they have to say. Uh, and surely, if they can move their eyes, someone will have thought of a way for them to express themselves. And someone did. Um, there was a solution that existed back then. And it cost 22,000 euros. And that just made me so angry. I was like, 22,000 euros just to be able to say, hello, how are you? How is your day? How did you sleep? Or you know what? It's, the weather is beautiful outside. Let's go for a walk. And so I thought, you know what, I'm pretty sure we don't need that really complex technology to make these people be able to express themselves. Um, all it takes, I'm sure, is a pair of glasses, we put a few sensors on it, and done. Easy. Um, I'm also a hardcore optimist, if you couldn't tell. Um, and so the great thing is because I was an engineering student, I had this project coming up. It was a year-long project, and usually these are projects uh, for which the subject are proposed by companies, by teachers, and sometimes, sometimes by students. So I thought this would be a great opportunity to work on this project. I thought I'd have time, resources, I could gather a team. Uh, and, that, and because I was a student, I really didn't have to care about how much money I would make out of this uh, because I could just focus on making a solution for these people. So I talked to my school and they said yes, and we gathered a team. And I cannot stress enough how much this is when the adventure really started. Before then, 
all I had was an idea. And I see this quite often, especially with young entrepreneurs. They have brilliant, brilliant ideas, but they really don't want to talk about it. They're convinced that it's a million dollar idea, billion dollar, dollar idea, and that's great. The thing is, your idea isn't worth anything until you actually start working on it. And to properly work on it, you need to work with other people. You need to work with a team, and you need to work with the people who are going to benefit from what you're trying to create. So, what happened here is that we tried to approach this with a little bit of humility because this feeling that I had, this feeling of empathy, of, of injustice and this need, this urge to do something about it, well, that's great to understand the first step. But no matter how much empathy you are capable of, there's just no way for you to understand what a person that is locked inside their body goes through every day, every second of the day or the night. And so the first step for us was to contact these people. So back then we went on Facebook. <laughs> we started to uh, to get in touch with the patients, their families, some NGOs, some support groups, some doctors, some nurses, just tried out some random emails. And here was our approach. We were like, hey, we're a group of students. We have an idea, um, it's a pair of glasses. Um, would you be willing to answer a few questions and try out some of our prototypes, plural? And so the people said yes. and. The number one idea that we had was to have a pair of glasses that would detect eye movements and then translate them into Morse code. And then this is how we could understand what the people were thinking about. So in asking the, quest the patient, sorry, they told us, all right, wearing glasses, yes. Learning Morse code, no. You're going to figure out something else. That's just not going to work for us. So we came back with a first prototype that looked, oh my god, I wish you could see this prototype. It was an old pair of sunglasses. We just kicked off the lenses and then taped, like actually scotch taped, set like huge sensors on them. And all they could do was detect blinking, like, like actual wigging. And in trying them out with the patients, some patients were able to do this movement, others not so much. Uh, what they could do though is they could move like at the tip of the brow or like in, on the eyelid or the pupil. So we came back with another prototype that was huge. It has 20 sensors on it. It was just enormous. And we tried it out with them and discriminated some of the sensors until we ended up with something that resembled uh, an actual pair of glasses that, um, that I have right here, um, just to show you what it looks like today. Oops, sorry. Um, so it looks like this today. And so my number one mistake was assuming that the basic, not, the basic sorry, need that had to be met for the patients was the need to communicate. And that's not really true. The number one need, because we work with patients who are sometimes under respiratory assistance, so essentially it's people who are hooked up to a machine to be able to breathe, sometimes in order to eat as well. And so if anything goes wrong with this machine, it can be fatal in like a very short amount of time. So the number one need that had to be met was the ability to call for help. And when you're dealing with people who cannot just click on a button to call for help, you need to figure out a different solution. So the first thing that the glasses did was detect an intentional movement in the eye in order to trigger a signal to call for help. That was number one. Number two was uh, developing an app that allowed the patients to actually communicate. So what the app did was uh, it allowed the patients to select letters and then type in uh, a few words and then a sentence and then you could save up the sentence so you didn't have to type it in all the time um, and that's that. And then the patients started to type in really funny things. I had this patient, uh, she typed in Scrabble. And then the next word that she typed was Facebook. And this other patient, I kid you not, he typed Excel, as in Excel sheets. Um, so that wouldn't have been my first choice, but that is not my call to make. So we were like, all right, we need 
okay, we need to code an accessible version of, of Scrabble, of Facebook, of Excel. And very quickly it became apparent to us that um, it was just not going to work. Well, like, first of all, it was very overwhelming. And second of all, everyone was just going to have different requests because these devices have infinite possibilities. So what we did with this pair of glasses that I just showed you is we created this device that allows you to control any smartphone, computer or tablet just by using your eyes. And in doing that, you are able to choose what you do with this technology. You can go back to work, you can go back to school, you can go on social media, you can play. You just have the power to decide what you do with the technology. And then the next step, bear with me, was testing our glasses with people who have cognitive disabilities. So, like I said, in f at first, our glasses were designed for people who hear and understand everything you tell them. But moving forward, we decided, how about we try it with people who actually have to learn or relearn how to communicate. So that's when we started working with this great young man who nine years ago was in a car accident. And it had been nine years that by looking at a scanner or an MRI, we couldn't really tell what was going on in his mind. But when he tested the glasses for the very first time, we could tell that he was reacting to them. So we decided to work with him for a few months, for four months to be precise, and every week we had sessions with him um, just to make him uh, control better his eye movements and do them longer, more intentional, make him understand really what's the connection between what he's doing with his, his eyes and the reaction on the device that he's controlling. And four months later, we were able to make him select images on a tablet in order to answer some questions. So not only did we get the proof that he could hear us and understand us, but also he could make choices. And I love that story because it drives me every day in my work and it is infinitely inspiring, at least to me. But what's great about this story is that if you take our initial population of users, if you take all the people who are paralyzed and who can hear and understand everything, who have no cognitive impairments, the population is this much. If you add in all the people who also have cognitive disabilities, then the, po the population becomes bigger. And currently we're working on making our glasses work with wheelchairs, so we're able to pivot the wheelchair, move forward in every direction, uh, just the seating position. We still have some work to do with uh, controlling the distance and the speed, but we're working on, we're working on it. Um, <laughs> and then we're also working with other startups that develop smart homes for the disabled. So because the, these houses are very smart, you can control your lights, your doors, um, so many things through an app. Because we control the app with the glasses, then the patients regain more and more autonomy. And what I love about this is that the more we spend time with our users, the more we position ourselves with humility and decide that we are the students and they show us what they need, the more we are able to grow the impact of our technology. So our technology now, this simple pair of glasses is able not only to respond to the needs of more people, but also allow our users to regain more and more autonomy, more and more independence. And so what's great is that in doing that, our technology gets to have more and more positive impact, but it doesn't really have to be more expensive because we're responding to more people. So our initial promise to ourselves and to the patients was that we were going to do a technology that was accessible on all levels. Um, I know I showed you the glasses, I didn't really show you how they work, but they are extremely easy to use, that's accessibility, accessibility of technology, then accessibility in terms of price, we, like, we are a fourth of the price of our competitors, and then the last thing that is key is that our team is very accessible. The patients know that they can call us and, and reach out to us if they have any need. And the more we spend time with our patients, the more our technology has functionalities and the more it has positive impact. 
So back to our question. Do we need innovation? Yes, a thousand percent, yes. Like I said, I'm a hardcore optimist, so I believe that our society can keep blossoming through sustainable innovation. But in order for that to happen, innovation has to be exactly that, sustainable. We just can't keep innovating uh, just for the sole purpose of innovating, of making things work harder, better, faster, stronger. Um, what we need to do is be mindful about why we innovate, who benefits from what we're trying to create and how. And for that, my very personal, very simple guideline to follow is empathy. Thank you so much. <laughs>